Welcome to the AT Parenting Survival Podcast, where you get help and guidance through the chaos of parenting a child with anxiety or OCD. This show is for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the guidance of a qualified professional. Here's your host, child therapist, Natasha Daniels. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of the AT Parenting Survival Podcast. Today, I want to talk to you about The messiness of OCD progress, it can be very messy. It can be messy when you're starting. It could be messy when you're in the middle. And it could be messy when you think you're done. And my hope today is to talk about how it shows up so that I can help you with your expectations, help you with your panic if you see something like this showing up and put it in perspective so that you can realize you're still progressing. It's just you're in the messiness of OCD progress. But before we get started, I want to thank NoCD for sponsoring this episode. NoCD offers affordable, effective, convenient therapy. They are available in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. And you can schedule a free 15-minute consultation to see if NoCD is the right fit for you and your child. Just go to treatmyocd.com. That's treatmyocd.com. I will leave a link in the show notes. And like I always say, don't forget to circle back with them because they are adding new locations, whether that is your city, your state, or your country, and new insurances all the time. Okay. I also want to let you know that I have a webinar that you can tap into that would be really helpful and dive deeper into five things that every parent raising a child with OCD should know. This is one of those things, but I don't think it's included in one of the five. And you can watch that webinar for free. So take advantage of that. That's natashadaniels.com slash OCD webinar. Again, natashadaniels.com slash OCD webinar. Check that out. It's a free webinar that I've made. And it's like everything I would tell my best friend if they came to me and told me that their child had OCD. And I care about you and you're my friend. And so go listen to that as well. All right, let's dive into today's topic. So I want to break this down into kind of the progression of the journey. So when you're starting, we're going to go with from when you're starting and then all the way to like when you're really making progress. So when you're starting new on the OCD journey and you're trying to educate your child about OCD and you're starting to do things that can stir up a lot of stuff. And so I want to break down a couple of the things that can happen when you're starting treatment. And even if you're not doing therapy, when we start to change the things that are happening at our house and we're interacting with OCD in a different way, it can have an impact on our child's OCD and sometimes not always good in the very beginning. So let me go through a couple of them. When you are increasing your awareness of your involvement with OCD and you're starting to reduce your accommodations, and I do actually have an entire workshop on how to pull back your accommodations. You can check that out at natashadaniels.com slash workshops. I also have a whole space program on like it's a full course on how to pull back your accommodations because that is a really important first component is how am I going to pull back these accommodations? Now, when you do that, your child's or your teen's OCD is going to have a toddler level tantrum about it because it's not getting fed. It's not used to not you not doing these things. And so your child is sitting with the discomfort, which is a necessary component of progress to learn how to handle the uncomfortable feelings that OCD gives them. That is at the crux of OCD progress is having our kids learn how to build their OCD muscles. That's what I call it, their OCD muscles. And so we don't get to control and they don't get to control whether they have intrusive thoughts or feelings. That's natural. That just pops up. They can't control whether they have intrusive thoughts, but they can control what they do with them. Are they going to respond with panic? Are they going to respond with distress? Are they going to respond with tons and tons of compulsions or avoidance, which is a type of compulsion? And as they learn how to handle those intrusive thoughts or feelings, they build up their muscle tolerance, metaphorically, to be able to handle the discomfort. And so a lot of times parents will say, oh gosh, I'm really nervous about pulling back these accommodations because I don't want my child to sit with discomfort. And that really is a key component. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not educating them on what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's going to help. That piece is really important too. But OCD doesn't care about that piece. OCD's like, I wanted to be fed. I'm starving. You didn't feed me. I'm going to have tantrum. 
And so it can look like, you know, that your actions are making it worse. Eventually that behavior gets extinguished as OCD realizes it's not going to be fed and grown, which really helps your child long-term. Yes, they will move into doing their own compulsions that don't involve you, but you're out of the equation. That's one step that you do get to control. And then we work to build our child's skills on how that they can reduce their own compulsions and we become more of a cheerleader and a coach, but we're not complicit in it, which is really key. And so a lot of times parents will say, oh my gosh, I mean, this is a headache. You know, I I mean, the meltdowns and, you know, my child's screaming, this isn't making them better. It's making them worse. I don't think this is helping. It's the messiness of OCD progress. And it is a necessary component. For some, it goes pretty quickly. And for others, depending on how long you've been doing these compulsions with your child or how acute their OCD is, it can be a little bit longer and tiring. In the SPACE program, so Ellie Leibowitz has a SPACE program, which is a parent-only approach to pulling back accommodations. And I have videos that go through that. And he's got a book that goes through it. It's systematic. And so it's not cold turkey. And I think that's a component. This episode is not about that. But I do want to just put a little shout out to, you need to do it in a very therapeutic way. We don't just pull back all accommodations at once and say, sink or swim. I I heard accommodations are bad. Um, And this is the messiness of OCD progress. Well, it's not black and white like that. It's more systematic. And so you definitely want to learn how to do that in a, in a kind therapeutic way. Another thing to be aware of is that when we start talking about OCD, OCD again does not like that and can have a tantrum about it. It can in the beginning make OCD worse. And so I was trying to think of metaphors for this and I have two of them and they're both weird, but I think about like if you had a burn and you're getting burn treatment, you go to the burn unit. And I don't know why this came up, but I think of, you know, the way to treat a burn is counterintuitive because they're scraping off, you know, the burnt skin, which winds up hurting the the person more. They're in more pain to get to that fresh skin so that they can, they can heal and repair. And it kind of reminds me of OCD when we start to talk about OCD and we start to pull back our accommodations and your child's learning about OCD, it flares not always. And for all of these things, not always. I've seen a lot of kids who they, you know, things don't get worse. They get better right away. But for some, it can make it flare up a little bit more. And um, same thing with the burn. It's like you have to get through that pain in order to get to that progress. Another analogy I thought of is like a beehive. And, you know, you're going in there and you're trying to get rid of all those bees and you're shaking up that hive. And you get into that queen bee, you know, that core, core feeling or the, those core fears. And you're really trying to dig in and yeah, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of bees going around. It's going to seem like you made the situation worse, but until you actually can see all the bees and they're flying around and you see what the situation is, you can't make it better, right? Because if they're hiding and they're dormant, you're not really getting rid of the problem. And so a, a lot of times parents will tiptoe around talking about OCD or they don't want to educate their child on OCD. And they'll say, you know, I only want to teach my child their OCD theme because if they learn about OCD in any other way, you know, it's going to be contagious. And I do have a whole podcast on this, so I'm not going to dive too deep into it. I'm actually looking for it right now as we speak because that's how I roll. So I did actually pause because I'm not that good, but you can check out episode 229. Can my child catch other anxiety or OCD themes to dive into my opinion on that? And if you just go to my website, at natashadaniels.com. I actually got a a better URL. So it's just easier for me to just say my name and then you'll remember it. It'll automatically redirect you to anxioustoddlers.com because I don't like the, I don't like anxious toddlers as my URL, but for those of you that have paid attention and followed me for, let's see, how long has it been? 2015. Oh my gosh, it's been eight years. It's been eight years I've been doing this. So yeah. Eight years ago, I started off with Anxious Toddlers, and I cannot get rid of the URL anymore. So I have a lot of redirects that go to Anxious Toddlers, but it will eventually pop up as Anxious Toddlers because I just can't get rid of it. But it's not for toddlers. It's for kids and teens. But you go to my website and then scroll all the way to the bottom, and you will find a search button, and you can always type in the, the title that I'm giving you, and you'll find it if you're having a hard time finding it on like Apple or Google. So there's another little way to, to do that. So 
OCD, I kind of equate it to an octopus and it's got tentacles and sometimes they are very sticky. And if they're really big, they're going to reach out and they're going to grab whatever. I did find in my practice that like when I had someone who I was trying to teach the skills to, so when I had a kid in my office and I was trying to explain to them how OCD works, it was actually easier for me to use a theme or a core fear that was not related to them because they were able to hear like the foundation of what I was teaching without getting triggered or overwhelmed that they might have to do something scary. So if they had contamination OCD and they were worried about, you know, germs and being contaminated, I could say, you know, OCD is just about having an intrusive thought or feeling and then the need to do or avoid something to get brief relief. That's called a compulsion. And the more you do or avoid, the bigger your OCD grows. And that's the same no matter what flavor you have. But let's use a different flavor other than yours just to show you how it works. And I would find more times than not, the child would get, first they would think that the the theme or the fear that I'm talking about is ridiculous because it's not related to theirs. And so they'd be like, why would someone be afraid of that? And I'd say, well, you know, somebody who has that core theme or themes, because you have multiple themes, might say the same thing about you, right? Because if it's not your theme, it it doesn't make sense to you. And that's okay. It doesn't have to. But I would see that they would be able to learn the concepts better because it was something outside of what they worry about. Once I brought up their theme, then they're thinking about it and they're you know, having intrusive thoughts about it. And so it was just actually a really good way to teach a skill or foundation and get them to learn other themes. Parents get nervous about this. Some parents get nervous about this because they think, oh my gosh, my child's going to then get moral OCD themes, now symmetry OCD themes. And my thought is OCD will pick themes that impact the child, that is a value. Not always, but if I really value being a good person, then I might get some moral OCD themes. If I'm worried about harming the people I love, I might get harm OCD. If I'm worried about being a really good person and I don't want to be racist, then I'm OCD might say I'm racist. And so it's really more based on your child's, you know, personality and their identity. And sometimes just about, I think, brain function and where it's impacting the brain. That's my own personal opinion. There's no, I don't have any research to, to cite for that, but I do, I do feel that way. And I, I can't wait till research kind of catches up with OCD and we understand it in the brain better. But there's some kids who have just like disgust. And, you know, I really feel like that's just purely physiological. Like I just am repulsed by this. It grosses me out. And there's no fear except for the fact that I'm fearful of having that feeling. So not always. But my point is, if I am going to get moral OCD themes, it doesn't matter if I'm going to get it because someone reads it in a book. Or because a teacher says something like, don't do this or you'll be a bad person, or you need to wash your hands this many times, and I'm already predisposed to have that theme, then yeah, I might get that theme. But that's not the problem. The octopus is the problem. So check out that episode because I do go more into it. I don't want to dive too deep into that here, although too late. But I think that's an important thing to recognize as well. Other things that can create some messiness in your progress is you might be doing well for a while, and then all of a sudden you hit new developmental stages. And so when you have new developmental stages, a couple of things happen. One, hormone shifts and changes can increase OCD, not always, but can. It is a component. And so if your child, you know, starts to menstruate or they're um, going through puberty, there is a chance that OCD might get worse. Sometimes I've seen it actually get better. And so it is just important to know that hormone shifts and hormone changes in general can impact OCD. In what way, right? That that depends on the child and their their body, but it's important to understand that. The other thing that happens with developmental stages is they learn new developmental things, including sexually taboo things, or they just, you know, as they're going through puberty, they have more of a sexual awareness. Their peers are talking about more taboo topics related to all sorts of things, including drugs, alcohol, sex, things that, you know, they're they're not cocooned from as much and you can't cocoon them from. And so OCD loves that. Like bring on the shame, bring on the guilt. Oh, this is a really taboo thought. I'm going to incorporate that in OCD. And so then we we might see a, a like a a flare up in new themes that are related to different stuff. And so that happens too. The next one is stressors. You know, life stressors can increase OCD and so you might See, see a lot of progress. And then all of a sudden you move house, you're getting a divorce, someone dies, you're going to a new school, just, you know, life stresses. 
And those environmental stressors can also sometimes increase OCD. Another thing is, you know, just something happens. It, you know, the octopus was not as small as you thought, and it just had, you know, just waiting for the right thing for that tentacle to stick onto. And someone said something and boom, here it is again. And so it, it is messy. There's not a, a linear progress with OCD. There's a lot of, there can, I don't want to say there is, there can be a lot of upheaval when you first start. And like I said before, I've actually seen a lot of people do amazing right from the get-go, like out of the gate, because all they needed to do was understand that they're not alone and understand that this is called OCD and this is what it is. This is how it shows up and this is how you work on it. And then the child is like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that this was normal. I didn't know whether people had this thought. I feel so relief. Now I know what, how to handle these thoughts. And it's not that they're like one and done, but the parents will be like, oh my gosh, it's like 90% better. And I have seen that too. So I want to sprinkle in a little hope that it's not always messy in the beginning, but sometimes it is. And it's not a sign that things aren't working. It's just a sign that, yeah, that's the messiness of working on OCD. When we get back, I want to talk about how we address these things, how we handle them and how we address them with our kids. Because when things are not going well, that can be really upsetting for us and it can be really upsetting for our kids. So stay tuned. We'll be talking about that after the break. It's time we put help directly in our kids' hands. Introducing Crushing OCD Course for Kids and Teens. It was way more helpful than all the other therapy we've ever done because we didn't really know what to do. So we weren't really doing it before. So the course helped to figure out what the exposures are and how to do them. We're not in therapy and find it really hard um, to find an ERP trained therapist here. Um, So we're currently with like the public health service, but again, they don't seem to be trained in ERP. It's filled that gap that we don't have that was desperately needed. This was really well timed for us to use between therapists and to help us like start get off to a good start with this new practice. It was easy to use. Um, I was able to do it from my phone or also on the computer. There's different ages, you know, so there were younger kids, there were teenagers. And um, so that was really nice too, to have a variety of ages where it wasn't just geared towards younger kids or older kids. It was a nice variety. It's helpful for our kids to hear it from this like third party as opposed to just us saying it. I really like the offense and defense method. I love working on poking at OCD while it's sleeping. It makes it a little bit easier to do and it's kind of fun. <laughs> I'm planning on using it to work on my uh, fear of like holding or touching batteries and stuff like that. So it was really helpful and I think a lot of other kids would like it. I thought that I was like the only one who had worrying about the weather and stuff. And then there was somebody else on there who worried about the same thing, which was really helpful. Seems less scary to work on stuff now that I've watched this class and I'm more interested to work on it. I like trying to do more exposures still and going to, before I wasn't, I just didn't want to do them. I've worked on some of my bigger compulsions and been successful. I realized that it was helpful to do like the exposures before it was like really, really hard. It's still hard, but it's helpful to know that I need to do them. Before there would be a lot of battles about it. So it is definitely less loggerheads. Really, really good course and super helpful. Definitely would recommend this. It's really easy to follow. It's a nice bite-sized videos. I really like the worksheets that go along with it, and I think it's really helpful. To learn more about this course and register your child or teen, go to atparentingsurvivalschool.com. Welcome back. Okay, so the first thing we want to work on is you, right? So when your child is not doing well or was doing well for a really long time and then all of a sudden starts to not do well again, It's important to remind yourself, maybe you need to listen to this episode, save it, you know, and, and replay it when, when you need it and you need that uplifting reminder of this is normal. This happens. If you're in an OCD community, you know, if you're in my AD parenting community, or if you're in my Facebook groups, you can ask people, is this normal? And they will say, yes, you know, things go up and things go down. So I think it's important to not, not think that it is catastrophic. And one thing to remember is that your child's skills, 
So let's say you worked really hard and your child worked really hard and you have all these skills and then you're doing really well for a period of time and then new themes are popping up. It doesn't mean you're going to go back to square one. It doesn't mean that it's going to be as ugly and dark as it may be the first time it happened. Your kids do have skills. Even if they seem like they're dormant, they are there and they can be easily tapped into over time. And then it kind of jump starts progress. And I've seen this with my kids many times where they'll be doing well for a while and then boom, a brand new theme pops up. And it's normal for you to feel panic. Like I, I will have panic and I will start to have that out of control feeling. And then I, I accept those feelings. I say, yep, this is normal to have these feelings. This is a normal response when, you know, your child's not doing well again, and you're worried about it going back to, you know, those darker times. And I'm going to remind myself as well that I know that this is normal. I know this happens and I know my kids have the skills and I know that I have the skills to help my child through this. We're not starting from scratch. It just, you know, it's those skills are inaccessible in the moment. And I've been surprised with like, that happened with my daughter last summer. No, it was that last March, actually. It's almost a year ago. Wait a minute. Was it March? I think it was where out of nowhere, she had a new theme and it was really debilitating for her and it overwhelmed me because it was a new theme. And it was like, you know, it was like just upsetting because it wasn't something that I was used to dealing with with her. And I did have that panic moment. And then within three days, I would say maybe within a week, she was doing much, much better. It's still, you know, these themes, you know, they're they're little baby tentacles. And so we're actually going away this next week. And although it won't be next week for you because I'm batching these, I already have been back. But we're going away. And I think it was March of last year when we were in Hawaii that it happened. It happened at a luau. (laughs) I know it's so weird, but it happened at a luau, this new intrusive thought, and it like ruined the whole luau. And she had to leave and she had to go to the hotel room. She had a panic attack. It was this whole thing. And we're ironically going back to Hawaii in March. And I was saying, Oh, are you excited about going? And she said, I'm a little nervous. And I said, Well, what's the scariest part for you? And I was expecting her to say stuff like, I won't be able to go to the bathroom or I'm afraid I'm going to throw up. Like those are her classic ones. And she said, are we going to a luau? And I said, we, we actually are. It's a different one. And she was like, I'm just so nervous about my OCD. And so it's a little tentacle still, right? Because we're like going to be in that same area. The intrusive thought isn't about a luau at all, but it just happened to occur in that environment. And so we don't want to be naive and say, these things are eradicated. Like there's imprints that are left in our kids that they're like little tentacles and it's not a big tentacle because I was, you know, we were able to process it. And I, you know, we talked about different things to address that, the core fear, but it's still like a little tentacle. And that's why doing maintenance ERP periodically can be really important. (laughs) And we did not do maintenance ERP on this topic and we should be doing it. I've talked to my kids, like, we're just not doing enough maintenance ERP especially my daughter. We just aren't doing it right now. And I share that because I want you to know, like, I don't always practice what I preach (laughs) and I'm human. Things get busy, you know, and when your children are doing well, you're just like, oh my gosh, I forget. My son's always doing exposures because his is around eating. And so he's always, I feel like working on it when he is trying to eat something that his OCD is saying not to eat. But we go through periods with my daughter where we're doing a lot of exposures Um, And I don't want to be reactive. I don't want to be doing them only when they pop up. And we do. Once they pop up, we hit it hard. Like she's doing exposures multiple times a day on that theme and we get it back small. But ideally, we should be doing exposures all the time periodically to keep that maintenance up. But this isn't about me. This is about you. (laughs) And so setting your expectations of the, the realistic understanding that OCD is cyclical. And that doesn't mean it's a death sentence. It means that you are maintaining your progress. And actually the next podcast episode I'm going to be doing, which is almost like a part two to this one is going to be called moving from OCD treatment to living with OCD, because it's that shift in thinking of, I have to cure this to, I have to learn to live with this. And I want to live with it in a way that it's not dominating my life. And so, yes, will there be times where it will get bigger and then get smaller again? Absolutely. And when I have that expectation and understanding and I let my kids know that too. They're not going to be as derailed when a new theme pops up. 
And we want our kids to understand this. It's why I don't, when I did therapy in my private practice, I wouldn't have kids graduate. I would have them move to my maintenance phase because I, it mattered to me what I was conveying to the kids. I didn't want kids to think you are done. You've graduated. You are cured. You don't have OCD anymore. I wanted them to realize that you've got this. You've got the skills. You are nailing it. You know exactly what to do when you have an intrusive thought or feeling. You know how to handle compulsions. You don't need my support. I'm going to check in with you once a month, or I'm going to check in with you every six months. I really, you know, I wanted people to have kind of that check in for a long time. And so normally we would do, we would move from weekly to every other week, then every other week to every three weeks, and every three weeks to every four weeks. And then we do once a month for about six months. And then we would go to just, every half a year. And then there were people that I was doing maintenance with where it was just a once a year check-in. And I found that really helpful because then I could say to kids, you might need to tune up once in a while. You know, OCD can come back, but you have the tools if it comes back and it's most likely going to come back. But if you're really good at being proactive and like paying attention to any disguise that OCD is coming, because it can be a totally new theme, but just remember it's any intrusive thought or feeling and the need to do or avoid something to get that brief relief. And I like to educate kids on themes, whether it's through books or I have a a kid and teen course that goes through various themes because kids and teens talk about their experiences in that course. And so they learn just in a natural, organic way, different themes and the way it pops up. And that's really important because then when kids are doing well and something new pops up, they're like, I actually think that's OCD too. My kids have been amazing at coming to me and saying, mom, that's an OCD thing. And I'm like, really? And not realizing that it is OCD and I wouldn't have spotted it. But my kids who realize they are the own, they're their, their own people. They, they, this is their journey and they have to drive their ship. They're aware that if they don't communicate that they're having an OCD issue or they're not working on it, that's kind of going to be a them problem, not a me problem. And not in a mean way, but like in a realistic way, like I am not in your head. You know, you and OCD have an intimate relationship I'm not privy to. And so you can choose whether you want to share what's going on or not, but you and OCD will know what's happening no matter what. And that's actually what matters the most. And so helping kids understand this is key. And then I talk about this octopus analogy. I actually have a YouTube video on it and I'll link it that is for kids and teens. And I talk about how OCD is an octopus. And just because it is grabbing a new theme doesn't mean that there's a lack of progress. A lot of times that can be discouraging to parents and kids because they think it's just whack-a-mole. And so I just, you know, we crush it in one area and it pops up the other. And so like, really, what's the point? Might as well just give into OCD because when we work on it, it just smushes itself into another theme. Yes and no, it does that, but it's often because OCD is on the run. And so a lot of times when it's rapidly switching themes, it's because it can't get a grip. It can't get its, it can't get tight into there. I don't know what I'm trying to say today. It can't get a really good hold on your child because you're working on it. And so then it's trying to find something else. And so it's not getting any traction. And so it changes themes. Also, when you're making a lot of progress, it'll try to sabotage. I do have, I just made all these workshops. That's why I'm like, I have a workshop on that too. I do. I have, there's four currently, there'll be five. I'm going to do one more with Kimberly Quinlan that is going to be coming out, or it might be out by the time this comes out. But I currently have four OCD workshops and they're only $25 each and you can buy them together and then you you can get them in a bundle and save money. But one of them is how OCD can sabotage success and what to do about it. And so again, that's another helpful one because if you understand the ways OCD is going to try to wreak havoc, you can be proactive and you can also prepare your child. Hey, look out for these things. This is kind of what OCD might do. You can check out those at natashadaniels.com. I love that. It's so easy to say. Uh, Slash workshops. And that will go over all four workshops that I have. And I'll add the fifth one when we record it. We haven't recorded it yet. So the last thing I think to remind your kids is to make sure that they understand that their skills are not gone. And so when OCD comes back up, just be like, all the work that you did is is not for naught. Not for naught? (laughs) sounds redundant, but I think it sounds right. It's there and we just have to tap into it. And it's like, you always know how to drive. You know, once you learn how to ride 
a bike, you know how to ride a bike, but if you haven't been on a bike in a while, you might be a little shaky, right? Your balance might be a little off for a minute and then you get your, your groove and it's like it never, that skill never left you. It's the same thing with OCD skills. And so doing a little prep work to remind your kids of that can be really, really helpful. So I hope that you found this episode helpful. I am going to keep it a bit shorter today because I don't have too much to say on this topic, but uh, I did want to make sure that we help you reframe your thinking. So don't forget that free OCD workshop. If you want to dive deep into that five things, every parent's raising a child with OCD needs to know it's natashadaniels.com slash OCD webinar. So check that out. And then I do want to I think I got a review that I wanted to read. (laughs) So if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to hit a star and rate it. I appreciate that. And if you have a few extra seconds and you can review it, you know, I love that. And I love it so much that when I see a new one, I like to read them out loud. I obviously can't do two things at once because I'm trying to find it while I'm talking to you. And so I do want to thank mom learning about OCD who wrote most helpful podcast for anxiety and OCD. My daughter recently received an OCD diagnosis at seven. Although we have been seeking answers since she was four, this podcast has been the most helpful resource for my family. Thank you for teaching skills, providing support, humor, and hope to so many families. Thank you for taking the time to write a review. I really appreciate that. And I am really glad that I'm able to support you. I think it's just great that you are already working on this stuff and gaining knowledge. The more proactive we are, the better. So maybe if you write a review, I'll be reading yours next time. So I hope that you find the sparkle in everything you do. And I'll talk to you again next Tuesday. Take care. Thank you for listening to the AT Parenting Survival Podcast. To get additional support raising a child with anxiety or OCD, visit Natasha's online school of on-demand classes at atparentingsurvivalschool.com.